or John 15, verses 1 to, 1 to 17. So this is uh, Jesus engaging with his disciples, speaking words to them, over them, with them, which also applies to us. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Bless you. (laughs) While every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more faithful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father I have, been, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my, na- in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love one another. Perfect. Thank you, Vince. And so there is a lot that we could unpack in that text today, and we're going to have to go a little bit high level today. So one of the things that jumps out at me that's repeated over and over is that the concept of remain or the word remain. Other translations use the word abide. Some even still say dwell. So I'm just curious what that term, what that phrase means to some of you. So if you're feeling confident, put up your hand or shout it out. So what words, ideas, images, even a short definition come to mind when you hear those words, remain, abide, or dwell? Believe. Believe? Thank you. To depend on? Attach? That was incredible. Did you guys just hear that? In stereo from two different people at the exact same time, where you live. You couldn't, we couldn't script that. Absolutely. Great. In conversation with someone else earlier this week, the person used the word home, right? For, for her, that meant a place of safety and security and dwelling. This Um, This verse makes me think back to Psalm 91, where we dwell in the shadow of God of the Most High. Or even if you fast forward to John 1, which is a text that we often end up reading around um, around Christmas time, the idea of incarnation, the message translation actually talks about God moved into the neighborhood, right? That idea of dwelling, right? A home. Absolutely. So the next question I have, and by a show of hands, how many of you would consider yourself to have at least one green thumb? 
put up your hand. Green thumb as in you love or you like the idea of working with plants. Okay, awesome, hands down, perfect. And two hands up, there's an enthusiast. <laughs> um, and there's no shame in this next question. How many of you have at some point in your life killed a plant? <laughs> yeah, and if you notice, there's actually a lot of the same people in both categories. So anyone who put up your hand for the second question, I'm gonna ask you to just wait outside. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. So this morning, this text has a lot to do with green thumbs and keeping plants from dying, although there is reference to some plants that have withered and not fared so well. And so we're going to actually, I'm going to invite Vince back up, and he's going to give us a high-level overview of pruning. Now, in Vince's defense, he is the um, resident pruner in our backyard and we have a few things to prune and so he's gotten quite good at it and also really enjoys it and so I wanted him to come explain some of the metaphors behind that and we'll hope the door stay <laughs> locked <laughs> and um, at the same time totally just lost my train of thought come on up <laughs> I'll just put this out there. I am by no means the authority on pruning. Um, I've just sort of engaged and entered into it in a novice capacity. But I do uh, often consult the country book of wisdom, uh, <laughs> which, which has taught me lots about pruning. And there's actually quilt patterns in here as well, if we want to look at some. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> just a little bit about pruning. So. There's some sort of guidelines. You, the idea is you try not to take more than 30% of, of the plant or bush or tree that you're working with. Um, you know, they prune for various reasons, right? You might have dead branches. You might have um, disease branches. Um, it might be overgrown. When we moved to our place, it was quite overgrown and things just looked kind of bushy and whatever. Um, Little did I know that actually pruning actually encourages more growth. And um, one of the things that you can do when you're pruning, when you, when you look at the bud, right, right, sort of the last one that you're going to leave on that stem, that's the direction that the next branch is going to go. So if, and I learned this out of, you know, uh, error <laughs> by pruning and then seeing branches kind of tapering off the other way. And, and now I finally understood that, oh, yeah, you got to pick a direction and then, yeah. And you don't want to prune too short and stuff like that. But um, for me, actually, it's interesting, Dana just mentioned a little bit about metaphor. I've, th this last year, just actually exactly a year ago, um, I took uh, a leave from work out of stress, um, anxiety, a lot of different things I was processing. And for me, that felt like a really, like a pruning season that I didn't feel like there was a lot of growth or anything going on. And this would be sort of a bit of a metaphor, I guess, for me was just like, God, how is this going to right itself? How am I going to get step back into what I've been in, in a way that is healthy? And um, the beautiful thing is, God's the gardener. Jesus is the gardener. And um, I'm not going to try and steal Dana's thunder here, but, but um, you know, my community of, um, of our, our life group, you know, those guys gathered around me and supported me. I was able to make meetings weekly with people and engage with Kevin and others over coffees and uh, fast food or other things too. <laughs> and, and, and just, it was interesting how the care brought me back to a place where today, if I look back at when I re-entered uh, the school year in fall, those, that fall semester from September to December was probably the most rewarding time I've had teaching. The, the most sort of fruitfulness I've seen in a classroom, and I just was like, oh, wow. Anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I just asked him to share high level. We didn't really compare notes. Um, but thank you for sharing vulnerability events of your story. That's a gift to all of us. So why prune, right? Vince went through a few things. I'm going to go through three, again, key points here. One of the reasons that you prune, that Vince already offered, is to remove what's dead, unhealthy, or diseased. 
So you think of a flower bed that's bloomed, but the flowers have now died. It doesn't look as beautiful anymore. So you could go along and remove the, the actual blooms, the dead, it's called deadheading, cleverly enough, removing the flowers that have come and gone. If you look out in the natural world in the autumn, this process happens naturally with any of the deciduous trees. The leaves, what happens to them? They fall, right? They have collected the sunlight for the tree for the course of the summer, and now the tree is going to become not dead, but dormant over the winter months. So that's one great reason to prune. The second reason is to cut back, cleanse, or trim in order to promote or make more, to pr sorry, to promote growth or more fruit. And Vince alluded to this as well. I think there was an image up there of a cherry blossom tree. It's okay, we don't have to go back to it. But that was one that was actually in our backyard. Oh, there it is, there she is, that Vince has pruned in our yard. And previously, it was kind of scraggly, and now it not only has a beautiful shape, but I think the blossoms are actually bigger. This passage is talking more specifically about vines, and we would think grapevines. And so anyone who's ever worked with or cared for grapes knows that there's both art and science behind it, and it's a very careful process. So the gardener who cares for the grapes, the wine dresser, the vineyard keeper, various names you could use, would actually go in and sometimes even cut off some of the grapes so that the rest of the grapes on the vine will actually become bigger and yield more fruit. I have to admit, this is really hard for me. I don't like wasting things, and this concept feels like a waste to me. So even as Vince is going through our backyard pruning things, do you have to? Didn't we do this last year? But the reality is, is it does. When done well, and like Vince said, less than 30%, when, when done well and carefully, it does actually promote more growth. And more, more beauty, more fruit. This passage uses the word cleanse as another metaphor or a similar word for, for pruning. And if you jump back a few chapters, we would have talked about this at Ministry, um, Ministry Center Sunday a few weeks ago. We, what was the topic? Foot washing, right? So Jesus was sitting around the table with his disciples after they had had the Passover meal together, and he washed their feet. So they've physically all been cleansed as they're entering into this conversation, as they're hearing Jesus talk about pruning and cleansing. I'm going to share a story that I have saved on email. So one of my favorite plants in our backyard is a peony bush. And I'll just jump in and read this. So I wrote this at the beginning of 2020. And so just pretend that this is when I'm reading this to you. So this is not actually this week. I want to share a story and metaphor. Two years ago, Vince did a major prune on our peony bush in our backyard. I walked into the backyard after he had pruned my favorite plant and nearly cried. It was hacked down to a fraction of the size it was earlier that day. I don't think the 30% rule was implemented that day. <laughs> the bush is unlike any I have ever seen before. When it is in full bloom, the flowers would overflow both of my hands with a beautiful, majestic magenta color. I was so shocked, sad, and quite frankly mad about the new state of our bush. He hacked it down without discussing it, with me, he just hacked it. And I did not discuss that I was sharing this story with him, so. <laughs> Actually, we joke about this story often. I couldn't help but think that the bush was done. It would never flower again. And it would never be the same. Too much had been taken away to properly recover. Last year, the plant grew back. I watched with guarded hope as the leaves filled out beautifully, and admittedly, they looked a lot healthier than before. But there were no flowers. My frustration remained, as did my uncertainty. Where would we find a plant to replace this one, and how much was that going to cost? This spring, the bush started to grow again, 
and this week I could see buds with hints of that fabulous magenta color. But I was hesitant to get too excited. With just the right amount of rain and sun and warmth, the blooms opened up the other day. Today they are so large that the flowers overflow both of my hands with that beautiful magenta. I know all metaphors break down, so just bear with me here. This plant had a full season without flowering. It would be easy to say that it was without growth, but that wasn't the case. Last season, the one without the flowers was an important one, without which I wouldn't see the blooms I do today. And so sometimes the idea of pruning feels a lot like hacking too much of a bush back, right? And day one after the hack, or after the prune or the cleanse, it's hard to know, is this gonna be a matter of days or weeks or months or years? Peter just alluded to the uncertainty he's facing in terms of this treatment this week. I'm sure many of us here have uncertainty that just, we just wanna know timelines, right? It's so much easier to think, okay, one summer, I'll wait it out and then we'll have the plants return, but we never know that in advance. And so this passage, I think, is just a, a call to return to the fact that who's pruning? The good, gentle, gracious gardener. And this is also a really great passage in Lent. Lent is when we join in and recognize and re-journey to the cross again with Jesus as we anticipate the life, the thriving that he has for us but it's also filled with hardship. It's also filled with uncertainty. It's really, really hard work to do that. Lately, we've been singing the song Waymaker, and there's a couple lines in that song that I just really love. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. And that is really good news. Okay, point number three. Why do we prune? To start something brand new. I was given a plant that looked approximately like this in the early days of 2020 by a client at work, and I'm not really supposed to accept gifts from clients of a certain monetary value, and I figured, I don't know what the price of this plant is, so I kind of snuck it into my cubicle where there was terrible light, watered it every Thursday, great. No one asked about it. Fast forward to March 2020, I started working from home, as did most of the world, and so I brought the plant home. It was the early days of the pandemic. We were weeks away from having Zachary join our family. The plant was the last thing on my mind. Admittedly, I stuck it on our washing machine in front of a bright window and pretty much forgot it. I was a very neglectful parent to it or caregiver to it. I was not a gentle <laughs> gardener. I would toss some water in it when I thought of it from time to time. Fast forward a handful of months, probably later that fall, a leaf opens up into one of these beautiful split leaves. And I realize, oh my goodness, this is the plant that I have been neglecting on our washing machine for months. I've had this like gem and treasure in my home this whole time and I had no idea. So then I start fertilizing it and caring for it and transplanting, <laughs> doing all the things I could have been doing the whole time. This plant was given to me by that client during a very difficult season of his life. And he had actually named the plant Hope. How beautiful. He gave me hope because he said that I was able to give him hope during some of his most challenging days. I had neglected hope, but hope nevertheless thrived regardless. And so the plant grew and grew, and I actually have divided it, and now we have four, maybe five of these same hope plants in various areas of our home. And the other week, the boys and I had a bunch of plants out on the back deck that we were replanting, just because that's another reason to prune. You can prune what you can't see underneath. The roots need to be healthy in any plant, especially in a house plant. Anyway, 
And as I was sticking a pole in the big hope plant, I cracked it. And this whole part, which is, as you can tell, was doing quite well, cracked off. And I had the same kind of experience as the day I saw the peony bush, but I didn't have Vince to thank for it because I did it myself. And so I stuck it in a bucket of water in a sink, and I haven't really looked at it since because I'm too sad. <laughs> But what I'm actually gonna do here today is we can cut this plant in a specific spot and I can stick it in water. And I am hoping that this will start to grow roots and those roots will grow roots. And I'm seeing a few of the green thumb people nodding at me, so I'm confident. This is increasing my confidence. This feels a little bit like lighting the advent candle here. It might work, it might not. I'm gonna cut it right at this spot on a nice 45 degree angle and I'm gonna stick it in here. This one is withering, so we're gonna cut that off, and maybe we can throw it in the fire, as the passage says. And I'm gonna stick it back in here. And what's the date today? Kevin's birthday, March 10th. I will report back throughout, over the course of time, and let you know how Hope is doing. So the metaphor here is that Sometimes we can start something brand new from something that seems lost or gone or broken, right? We can start a new plant. I could maybe even give it to someone here who needs hope in their life. This passage is Jesus speaking to some of his closest friends on some of his final days. And as we read through these texts, as we hear from Dwight in the next few weeks, next week maybe, we're, we need to just listen to this. These are the words. These are, he knows he has a limited amount of time left, and this is what he's choosing to share. This is how he's speaking with the people who mean the most to him. And that, to me, is so beautiful. Last week, we heard from Carl, and we, we worked our way through John 14, and Carl did such a beautiful job of, first of all, highlighting the, the challenge in that passage when it talks about the command of love, right? And so he flipped it to, to say the invitation of love. If you haven't had a chance to hear that message, I encourage you to go back and do so. And so this passage here, we are now invited to dwell in love. This love is going to carry on forward whether Jesus is physically present with his disciples or not which is also good news for those of us here today with whom Jesus is not physically present. Jesus is calling us to, be, to yield fruit that will last. And this morning we've already heard so many stories of fruit. Sarah getting to go and meet Moses, right? Sarah will come and, and have stories and things she's learned and seen that she hasn't seen before, something new. Peter's just shared with us the long-lasting uh, family tree, if you will, of Coast Hills and the financial fruit that is bearing, that has been born or will be paid forward. There's so many things that, so many ways that we can continue to be fruit. We're going to end off here, and maybe Trevor and the band can come up, and I'll just have a few reflection questions up here. So what could be pruned in you or your life to find health? What could be pruned in you or your life to make room for something new to grow? And what could be pruned in you, sorry, what in you or your life is feeling neglected, forgotten, or unwanted that could grow into something brand new, brand new hope or something beautiful. So Jesus, we thank you for the way that you sat with your closest friends and you pointed them towards growth, that you pointed them towards ways that they would thrive. You also pointed out that not all seasons feel abundant, that some feel uncertain and unknown. And so we pray that you, we thank you that you are with us through all of those seasons, and we pray that we might have a sense of how 
what fruit is in us and how we can extend that to others. We pray this in your good and holy name. Amen. you to sit in that and sing with us as we reflect on that metaphor and those words. And we sing the doxology together. God, we praise you. 